growths on this head of rye are the sclerotia of ergot, claviceps purpurea. The sclerotia, from the Greek skleros, hard, occur on many grain crops and grasses. They contain a group of alkaloids, of which ergotamine, specific in the treatment of migraine, and ergometrine, of great value in obstetrics, are now the most widely used. At least as early as the 16th century, midwives in Europe used ergot to speed labor and control postpartum hemorrhage. Then this knowledge was largely forgotten. It was rediscovered in the New World when John Stearns heard the tale in Massachusetts early in the 19th century. He drew the attention of doctors to its medicinal possibilities and obstetrics. But there are two sides to the ergot story. On the one hand, there is its value in therapeutics. On the other, its poisonous nature. For centuries, the European peasant has used rye in his bread. And rye is particularly susceptible to the fungus. Frugal in habit, ignorant of the dangers, the impoverished peasant often neglected to remove the ergot from the rye. So the fungus milled with the flour found its way into the bread. Damp years increase the danger, for it is then that the fungus thrives, the harvest poor, and each ear of grain valuable. In popular tradition, records abound of the sufferings of people, especially the poor, of fiery burning pains along the limbs, mutilations from gangrene, delirium, convulsions, hallucinations, and in many cases, death. As long ago as 1095, an order, named after St. Anthony of Egypt, was founded to take care of these sufferers, so that the gangrenous condition, particularly with the burning pains which preceded it, became known as St. Anthony's fire. But several centuries were to elapse before ergot became suspect. A French suggestion by Dodar in 1676 seems to be the first trustworthy reference to this connection. His ideas were not widely circulated, and so the outbreaks of ergot poisoning continued. They occurred even in England, a country where rye has never been widely used. One outbreak occurred at Watersham near Bury St Edmunds in 1792. In the tower of the village church, there is a tablet recording the deaths of the wife and children of a poor agricultural labourer. parish register gives a vivid description of their sufferings, but it is obvious that ergot was not suspected as the cause. Elizabeth, the next daughter, aged 14 years, was on the next day, namely, Monday, January the 11th, 1762, seized only in one leg and foot, which she could not set on the floor for three weeks, but stood all that time upon the other, leaning against the chimney, after which being taken in the same manner in her other foot, she lay down, one foot mortified and came off at the ankle, the other leg near the knee. In the London Medical Times of 1847, there is an account of mutilation which occurred to a young Irishman who ate rye bread. He lost fingers and toes through gangrene. Again, as recently as 1928, some Jewish immigrants in Manchester were taken ill with characteristic symptoms after eating bread made from rye which was later proved to have been infected with ergot. But perhaps the most disquieting outbreak was that which occurred in France in 1951, disquieting in that it could still occur today. From the small town of Pont-Saint-Esprit came news of the sufferings of the people there. Through the newspapers, the world learned of the hallucinations, convulsions, delirium and deaths which had resulted from ergot poisoning. Unfortunately, the poisoning of farm stock from ergot-infected grasses other than rye is still fairly common. This heifer is typical. It is lame as the result of gangrene developing in the extremities. Here it is in the hoof and also in the tail. Ergot belongs to the group of fungi known as ascomycetes. It is therefore related to the stag's horn fungus, Silaria hypoxylum, the devil's bunion, Daldinia concentrica, the edible morel, Morchella crassipes, the vegetable caterpillar, a species of cordyceps, 
the coral spot fungus, Netria cinnabarina, the orange peel fungus, a species of Zyza, and also, here shown growing on a crust of bread, Penicillium notatum, the microscopic mold from which penicillin is derived. The ergot sclerotium is a tough resting body which, when fully developed, falls from the ear. During the winter, it lies on the soil. Germination depends on this period of exposure to cold. In the spring, a number of little stalked bodies grow out from the sclerotium. The tips of these stalks become globular and pitted with little holes. From these holes, the spores will eventually be ejected. The holes are the openings of small flask-shaped cavities, the perithesia. This is how the perithesia appear in a stained section. Each perithesium is lined with fungal threads, the hyphae. A single multinucleate hypha elongates and produces a side branch. After nuclear division, copulation takes place between these branches and the nuclei associate in pairs. Elongation occurs and cell walls are laid down. Small projections, each containing two nuclei, grow from the sides of these cells. This process is known as hook formation. After a further synchronous division, fusion takes place, while the nuclei, which have not fused, proceed to further hook formation. The cell now elongates enormously to form an ascus. The diploid nucleus divides to form eight haploid nuclei, around which the protoplasm aggregates to form eight cylindrical ascus spores. Each ascus, when it has matured, ejects its ascus spores, and they are blown away in the wind. At this time, the rye is coming into flower. The anthers, three to each flower, burst forth and shed their pollen. Later, the feathery stigmas are exposed. Ascospores, carried by the wind, adhere to them. The ascospores send out hyphae, which grow down through the fragile tissues of the stigmas and penetrate the ovary. Soon, the fungus will have replaced quite a proportion of the normal ovary tissue. This is a longitudinal section through an infected flower. In the central mass of the fungus, pockets are formed from which enormous numbers of little conidia spores are liberated. These conidia spores, or conidia, are ovoid in shape, not long and thin like the asker spores. At the same time, a strong sugar solution called honeydew is secreted and slowly wells out between the florets. In these drops of honeydew are numerous conidia. Insects are attracted by the honeydew, which sticks to their bodies, and they thus carry the spores to other rye flowers. If deposited on the stigmas, the spores will germinate, as they are doing here, and infect the ovaries of more flowers. In this way, an infection spreads throughout the crop. The tissues of infected ovaries, instead of developing into grains of rye, become replaced by fungus. The external hyphae darken in color. Spores and honeydew are no longer produced. A new generation of sclerotia has been formed, and the life cycle is complete. In August, the sclerotia will be dropping to the ground again. Next spring, each sclerotium will develop ascophores, in the heads of which ascospores will be formed. These will be ejected and infect the rye. Honeydew will be produced. Later, a new crop of sclerotia will be formed. Ergot 
will grow on a variety of cereals and other grasses, such as wheat, barley, ryegrass, lollium perenni, tussock grass, Discampsia cispitosa, coxfoot, Dactylus glomerata, and Yorkshire fog, Holcus lanatus. The demand for ergot alkaloids for medicinal uses is increasing and greater quantities are being used annually. Supplies can only come from the grasslands and cereal farms of the temperate zone. To the peasants of some of these areas, such as those of northwest Spain and Portugal, the fungus which infects their rye has now become an important crop. The peasants pick the ergot by hand from the standing crop and when they feel it will command the highest price, take it to dealers in the local village market. Such a village is Arcos de Valdebesh in northern Portugal, close to the Spanish border. Here the dealers set up their stalls. Barter is often the vehicle of trade and few are the dealers who inquire whether the ergot was smuggled across the border. These supplies of ergot are subject to wide variations in quality and price. Because of the constant commercial tug of war between dealer and peasant, regularity of supply can never be guaranteed. At a porto, the ergot is dried and inspected before being shipped to Britain and other countries. 20 sacks of ergot may yield as little as 100 grams of ergometrine, the yield depending greatly on the strain of ergot. Thus, it is not surprising that a great deal of attention has been paid to the possibility of cultivating ergot and developing better strains. In the laboratory, it is possible to dispense with part of the normal life cycle. Conidia are produced by a mycelium which is grown under sterile conditions from the sclerotia. A sclerotium is washed, surface sterilized and rinsed. Now soft enough to cut easily, sections are placed on a nutrient medium in petri dishes. After suitable incubation, a mycelium begins to grow. Numerous subcultures are prepared. First on slopes in test tubes, then later in Thompson bottles. The conidia are dislodged from the final culture by shaking with glass balls in water. A suspension of spores is thus prepared and is removed by suction. Pure cane sugar is added to make a 50% solution. This fluid is maintained at a low temperature to retard germination of the spores. A trial dilution is prepared to determine the concentration of spores. A counting chamber is used for this purpose. Here, through a microscope, we see the appearance of the conidia. By counting the spores and a known number of the cells of the counting chamber, the concentration in the original suspension can be calculated. In the field, the stock suspension is diluted according to the calculations made in the laboratory. various ways of infecting the ears of rye with the inoculum, but this one gives a high percentage of satisfactory results. Each worker has a felt pad which he dips into his suspension of spores. He claps the ears between the felt pad and a clapper set with needles. The spore suspension is thus forced into the rye tissues through holes made by the needles. At 
a later date, the ears missed by the clapping technique are infected with spores obtained from the developing honeydew. Under natural conditions, this operation is performed by insects and is therefore unpredictable. And so man aids nature in ensuring completion of the task. Using brushes with nylon bristles, the worker sweeps the honeydew from plant to plant. His protective clothing is necessary because of the sticky nature of the honeydew. These techniques achieve two objects. They enable known strains of ergot to be perpetuated and they ensure a heavy and satisfactory crop. Sir Henry Dale, at that time Dr. H. H. Dale, initiated the pharmacological study of ergot alkaloids. In a paper in 1906, he drew attention to the remarkable activity of these compounds. His two collaborators, Barger and Carr, were thereby enabled to isolate the first of the ergot alkaloids, ergotoxin. Ergotamine was isolated some 15 years later. In action indistinguishable from ergotoxin, Ergotamine has the advantage of being easier to prepare and hence is more widely used in medicine. Ergometrine, a more recent discovery, differs in type and action from ergotoxin and ergotamine. All the known ergot alkaloids are derivatives of lysergic acid. Ergometrine is composed of lysergic acid and D2 aminopropanol, while ergotamine is more complex. These, the two ergot alkaloids most commonly used in medical practice, have to be separated from the many other substances contained in ergot. The methods we are about to see are essentially the same as those used in large-scale manufacture. The ergot is ground and macerated with sodium bicarbonate and water. The mixture is transferred to a percolator and extracted with an organic solvent. This percolate, containing all the alkaloids, is chemically and physically assayed. Then an acid solution is added to the percolate, which, on shaking, takes out the alkaloids. The solution is run off, and transferred to a vessel where it is treated with alkali. This precipitates the water-insoluble alkaloids, comprising ergotamine, ergosine, ergocornine, ergocryptine, and ergocrystine. From the filtrate, the water-soluble ergometrine is extracted with chloroform. After concentration, crude ergometrine crystallizes out. It is further purified to give ergometrine malleate. Ergotamine is specific against migraine, the symptoms of which are unilateral headache, visual disturbances, nausea and vomiting. Unfortunately, ergotamine, when given by mouth in adequate doses, increases the nausea and vomiting. Even when potentiated by caffeine, the smaller dose of ergotamine is still liable to induce these side effects. So the potent and rapid-acting antiemetic cyclazine hydrochloride is added. This successfully counters nausea and vomiting, whether due to ergotamine or to the migraine. More, it allows the dose of ergotamine to be increased. Migril is a product compounded to meet these requirements. The use of ergot to promote contraction of the uterus and to control postpartum hemorrhage, as we have already said, dates from very early times. The midwives of long ago used an aqueous extract of ergot and this type of extract was official in the 1914 British Pharmacopoeia. In the 1932 revision, it was replaced by an alcoholic extract on the ground that the active principles known at that date, ergotoxin and ergotamine, were soluble in alcohol but scarcely at all in water. Many practitioners, however, after trying the new preparation, expressed a preference for the old watery extract. Their views and incidentally, those of many generations of midwives were vindicated when the obstetrician, Dr. Shasser Moyer, clearly showed by mechanical tracings that the watery extract caused a powerful contraction of the human uterus after childbirth 
and that this action could not be explained by any of the then known alkaloids. And here is Professor Chassamoir to continue the story himself. These were exciting days, and I vividly recall the details of the hunt for this new active principle of Herbert. I was working at the time with Professor F.G. Brown in University College Hospital, London, and now, at Sir Henry Dale's suggestion, I also collaborated with the, with the chemist, the late Dr. H. W. Dudley, Dudley preparing the ergot fractions, and I testing them on the human subject. After three years of continuous work, Dudley succeeded in 1935 in isolating the elusive principle, which at Sir Henry Dale's suggestion, we named algometry. Metra being the Greek for uterus. Our paper described ergometry as an alkaloid over three times more soluble in water than in alcohol, and by far the most potent oxytocic agent yet isolated from ergot, with the property also of being rapidly absorbed when given by mouth. Shortly after the publication of our paper, the same alkaloid was described from three other laboratories where the search for it must have been simultaneously but independently in progress. In the United States pharmacopoeia, by the way, uh, ergometrin is known as ergonovine. And now let us see ergometrin in routine use at University College Hospital. This patient is in the second stage of labor. As the child is born, ergometrine will be administered. Its action is to promote contraction and retraction of the uterus, thus expelling the placenta and minimizing the risk of postpartum hemorrhage. The story of ergot is not yet ended. New strains have been propagated, new compounds sought. Who knows what undiscovered secrets may still remain within this quite extraordinary fungus. <laughs>